My name is Chelsea Gable. Hayden read my bio <laughs> this morning. Thank you, Hayden. Um, I'm a Métis scholar here at McMaster University uh, in the Department of Health, Aging, and Society and in, with the Indigenous Studies Program. Um, and I'm very much looking forward to our third panel uh, this afternoon, which is definitely, it transitions well into our panel, our second panel of the day, which is great. Um, so this panel, From Pretendians to Nativer Than You, New Articulations of Indi Indigenous Citizenship, um, this panel kind of came about because there are so many debates going on right now um, around Indigenous citizenship, um, Indigenous identity in Canada and United States. Um, we talk about things and hear things about ethnic fraud, um, wherein the claiming of identity for personal gain is brought forward, DNA testing, uh, blood quantum, evictions. And so I think today some of our panelists are going to help us make sense of some of these issues. Um, Daryl LaRue's work is concerned with documenting and explaining how people are attempting to reconstruct indigeneity in ways that counter indigenous sovereignty and self-determination and looks quite extensively at debates about citizenship and belonging, and especially the importance of kinship, kinship practices in indigenous ontology. Uh, Jill's work focuses on the politics of white settler self-indigenization. Gahante's work explores Haudenosaunee adoption, belonging, identity formation, and other aspects of indigenous presence. So I think we have a really great panel. Um, some of the questions that our panelists are going to be answering this afternoon or, or speaking to uh, talks about what are some of the contemporary terms of indigenous membership, identity, and belonging? What are communities doing or what are they trying to do to take control of their citizenship identities and what does this look like? And hopefully we can have some conversations and discussions about some creative and innovative ideas and solutions to some of these questions. So I'm going to read your bios. Um, they're, not, oh, they're not too long. Um, so I'll start with Dr. Jill Dorfler. White Earth Anishinaabe is an associate professor and the department head of American Indian Studies at the University of Minnesota, Duluth. She is committed to community-engaged research with indigenous nations and communities and was involved in constitutional reform efforts with the White Earth Nation from 2007 to 2015. Her book, Those Who Belong, Identity, Family, Blood, and Citizenship Among the White Earth Anishinaabe examines Anishinaabe resistance to racialization and the complex issues surrounding tribal citizenship and identity. Dr. Kahante Horn-Miller, she walks ahead, Mohawk Assistant Professor in the School of Indigenous and Canadian Studies and co-director of the Center for Indigenous Research, Culture, Language and Education at Carleton University. Her community-based research involves bringing new life to old traditions. Academics for her is about putting indigenous theories into practice. Through her work, she challenges others to learn about themselves as human beings, fostering relationships between indigenous and non-indigenous peoples that go beyond the written word, the classroom, and the research setting to reconnect us to the realities of reinvigorating indigenous traditions in the modern world. And finally, Dr. Dale Relue. R LaRue was born in Sudbury to French Canadian parents. He's now an associate professor in the Department of Social Justice and Community Studies at St. Mary's University in Halifax. And his current research examines self, settler self-indigenization among French descendants, primarily in Quebec, but also in Ontario, Nova Scotia, Vermont, and New Hampshire. He's completing a book manuscript tentatively titled Hyperdescendant in an Age of Reconciliation, which I believe he's going to touch on a little bit today, that provides a detailed account of the phenomenon of French descendants becoming Aboriginal between 2004 and 2017. So very much looking forward to this panel. I think it's gonna create some interesting discussion and debate. Um, and I think we will start, we've got our order figured out and we'll start with uh, Dr. Jill Dorfler. So thanks very much. Excellent, thank you. Um, thanks so much, um, Miigwech, for having me here today. I learned a lot this morning. I really appreciate the presentations. Um, I'm gonna be speaking from the viewpoint of, from the United States side of the border, so um, 
we are in a very different kind of political context than you all are in Canada. We, uh, I can't imagine President Trump using the word reconciliation <laughs> at all. So it's a very different kind of scenario that we're in. Um, but I'm going to talk really about my, my research with the White Earth Nation um, and citizenship, sort of past, present, and future, really drawing upon a lot of what I wrote in my book, Those Who Belong. So um, I'm going to approach this from the idea of, of us making change, uh, much like the, the panel before lunch talked about. Oh, yes. So now I'm going to use a clicker, which I never use. <laughs> We'll be fine, I'm sure. Here, here's a couple of maps for us, just because I always like to show maps, but especially since um, I'm going to talk about White Earth. So we see the kind of location in western Minnesota. I'm from White Earth. I grew up here, um, just outside of Monoman area. And so my research then is with my home community. I am an individual who is not enrolled. I am considered a first degree descendant. My mother is enrolled as a citizen of White Earth, and I am not. And so I have a vested interest, like all people uh, connected to White Earth, in citizenship. So I'm going to start with a little bit of historical context. Here we are. Um, so, White Earth participates in a larger governing structure called the Minnesota Chippewa Tribe. That legal entity was created in 1936 in accordance um, in the U.S. with the Indian Reorganization Act of 1934. So, it's White Earth and it's five other Anishinaabe nations together um, under the umbrella of the Minnesota Chippewa Tribe. Initially, that constitution basically said that the tribe has the right to make decisions about citizenship. And it was pretty vague. Um, they had a time when they were trying to get things figured out. They came up with a base role in 1941. And once that base role was established, they really used lineal descent as the requirement for tribal citizenship. That did not go over well with the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Um, so all throughout the 40s and 50s and into the early 1960s, there was significant pressure from the Bureau of Indian Affairs on the, the governing uh, body of the Minnesota Chippewa tribe to change citizenship requirements. And a lot of the arguments um, in the letters that the Bureau would send to the Minnesota Chippewa tribe, they would say, um, Things like every name that you add to your membership role, that decreases the share that each individual has. And so they would often point back to resources to try to get uh, the elected leadership to change tribal citizenship to either um, blood quantum or residency, or the Bureau said some combination of those things is what they would recommend. So. Elected leadership discussed these issues at length. The records are wonderful and really detailed. And in those records, leaders made lots of impassioned speeches about children and the future and how it was their responsibility to take care and ensure that the children would be included and provided for in the future. And the idea of blood quantum, they said, we can clearly see that blood quantum would cut out our children. And so there's lots of rich quotes um, from those documents about citizenship. And I just pulled one very short one here um, where the elected leadership, uh, one member said, we have to be guided by the love of your children, your little grandchildren. Even they are mixed bloods. And there's many others um, that were very lengthy and passion speeches thinking about this topic of citizenship. So. Um, the Minnesota Chippewa Tribe Governing Body, on a number of occasions, passed resolutions requiring lineal descent for tribal citizenship. And then the process that was in place at this time was they would send that resolution to the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and the Secretary of Interior would reject it because the Secretary had approval power. And the Secretary would say, that's all well and good, but you really don't know what you're doing. You're making a grave mistake. You don't understand the consequences of these things and would reject that. 
and send it back for further consideration. And one time, even, even the Indian agent says, you know, they've really deliberated on these matters. <laughs> they, this is what they want. And the Bureau just wasn't having it. And so then basically, 1961, the elected leadership of the Minnesota Chippewa tribe reluctantly agrees and passes a blood quantum requirement for citizenship. It's one quarter Minnesota Chippewa tribe blood. And so they're, they're sort of melding then what they see as the blood of each of those six uh, participating entities as the requirement. Um, so they start, they passed that in 1961 as the governing body that goes into effect. And then later in 1963, the whole constitution of the Minnesota Chippewa tribe gets an overhaul. There's big changes in governance and then citizenship is then codified in the constitution at that point, along with all of these other changes. So this has then had a lasting impact and I'm going to rapidly fast forward in time now to the more contemporary era. So the, the elected leadership was exactly right in the 1940s and 50s when they said, if we implement this, it's going to have a huge impact on the next generations. And it, and it has. We know at White Earth, for example, our population has peaked and has been declining over the last number of years in part uh, due to that citizenship requirement of the one quarter MCT blood. And so uh, Chairwoman Irma Visner was elected in part on a platform of reform. And so she, in her 2007 State of the Nation address, talked about that White Earth needed constitutional reform. And she noted separation of powers and enrollment being so two primary issues that needed to be addressed. And she also committed in her speech that day and in many of her campaign promises that ultimately the people of White Earth would vote on these issues, that this wouldn't be a decision made by leadership alone, that the people would participate and ultimately the people would decide. Um, and here is a little bit convoluted as well because now we're shifting to White Earth only. I'll just say in brief that there had been um, at various points, efforts for change at the Minnesota Chippewa tribe level. And that just wasn't possible, it wasn't happening. And so Chairwoman Bisner decided to just move ahead with the idea of a constitution just for White Earth and then think about the relationship with the Minnesota Chippewa tribe sort of after. And I can answer questions about that later. Um, so. Pushing ahead, then uh, the chairwoman said we will have a constitutional convention process. She called for volunteers to be a part of that process. And we held four constitutional conventions from 2007 to 2009. It was an open public process, um, but the participation was not what we would like to see. There would have been definitely a desire for wider participation in these open processes, but um, nonetheless, uh, the chairman was committed to moving forward and she, she would often say, well, there's never going to be a perfect process. We've, we're making these efforts, we're reaching out, and ultimately we have to keep moving ahead. Uh, so at these conventions, there was a wide range of issues discussed. Citizenship was definitely among uh, the more heated topics. Citizenship is one of those issues that everyone has a vested interest in and everyone has an opinion on, um, maybe more so than some of the other nitty gritty details of the Constitution. So um, we had those discussions at those conventions. I presented on some of my historical research and detailed and recounted how the MCT came to adopt that blood quantum requirement as well as some other history of how blood quantum was used to dispossess people at White Earth of their land allotments in the 19-teens. And then we tried to ask some questions that could guide us in thinking about these hard emotional issues. And so we asked things like, what kind of citizenship requirement will put our beliefs, values, and culture into motion? How might we get our values? We know our core values of love and family. How can that be expressed in us? How can we get these values into our governance structure? 
um, how can we strengthen our nation? How can we know that we're planning for the future, for the nation to go on in perpetuity? And so um, we had good conversations. We had a wide range of ideas expressed at these meetings and really good dialogue. Um, the big issue that comes up is really um, lineal descent. Well, there was a lot of talk about that. And a lot of people acknowledge that we know blood quantum isn't a real thing. We know that it's so problematic, but you know, where do we really go? Lineal descent, that's just gonna, there are just gonna be too many people sort of with lineal descent. That was one of the concerns. Uh, much like the Bureau of Indian Affairs had been saying to the Minnesota Chippewa tribe in the 1940s, Interestingly, we had some White Earth people who were articulating the very same viewpoints as the Bureau had been pushing in the 1940s. They were articulating those arguments in the early 2000s. Uh, so from the historical perspective, that was sort of interesting. Um, so there's this question about there, there might be too many people. How can we take care of all these people? How can we provide enough resources for everyone? And our chairwoman and others talked about resources and knowing that tribal leaders always have to manage resources. In some ways, there will never be enough, but in some ways, there is also always enough as long as it's managed. And so we also talked about reciprocity when it comes to services. So what about... Um, what we know that as an Anishinaabeg, we all have gifts. So what can you contribute back? How can we create a system where people could maybe volunteer or participate in some other way? Also, of course, with, the qual with uh, resources or access to programs, there's always qualifications. There may be income, residency, age, anything like that may be a part of a way to kind of decide how resources should be allocated. Um, thinking about priorities, the example here, thinking about maybe scholarships, uh, how could those be regulated? Well, maybe there has to be an income level, maybe there has to be a kind of GPA level, maybe we want to prioritize people who are willing to major or minor in a specific area. Um, all of these types of things are kind of discussed as possibilities in thinking about citizenship in relation to resources. Ultimately, as we moved forward to think about um, the writing phase, uh, I was working with Gerald Visner, and he said, you know, we really need to have two distinct clauses when it comes to citizenship. We need to, as much as possible, parse out the idea of entitlements from the idea of citizenship. And so ultimately, that's what we did was two clauses. Um, the first relates to lineal descent. Ultimately, all the tribal delegates who participated in the convention process voted for lineal descent. And so then we moved forward with that. Um, so moving back to that pre-1961 kind of style that we had in place, the language here establishes that it's not um, automatic conferral. There has to be a process for application for citizenship. What we like about that is the individual autonomy that that recognizes, as well as the family decision-making process. Um, and so that, that provides for that. And then we have the second article, which then deals with services and entitlements. So the idea here is that services and entitlements that are provided to uh, the citizens will be regulated in a host of ways. And so we kind of listed everything here. Sometimes White Earth might be accepting state dollars for a program. They have to follow state regulations. They might be accepting federal dollars. They will follow federal regulations. White Earth might be spending its own money. It might create its own qualifications and regulations. And so. We uh, worked that into this clause here. Then, political waters turn slowly. Uh, we move forward in 2013 with a vote on the Constitution. Um, and 
we get 80% of people who vote in the Constitution vote in favor. And it was interesting because even though I think a lot of people would have articulated citizenship as one of the most controversial issues, I think it was also one of the issues when I would talk to people that motivated them to vote because they wanted their grandchildren or they wanted their children to be a part of the tribe. They wanted to see that continuance. And so even though sometimes it's pegged as controversial, I actually think by and large it's not. Uh, it's that there's a smaller group of very vocal people who were against it, but clearly there's a more silent kind of majority that were in favor. Um, so at White Earth, the, we, we thought the chairwoman said we sort of have a mandate, now we have to go forward. And instead, what happens in tribal politics is the winds of change. Um, the Tribal Council did not adopt a transition plan after the vote on the Constitution. And they proceeded with elections under the Minnesota Chippewa tribe. And in June, so we passed the, the Constitution passed in November of 2013. In June of 2014, three new elected leaders swept into office, which is a quorum for us at White Earth, and they were not interested in implementing the Constitution or considering that at all. Um, they decided to not allow any information about the Constitution to be published in the tribal newspaper and to enact a number of uh, ways in which they made their, their opposition to the Constitution known. And so we've remained then in this kind of limbo period related to this governing document. White Earth continues to participate and govern under the Minnesota Chippewa Tribe Constitution. Um, there is still a lot of people who want change at White Earth and will be moving into an election cycle with primaries in April and elections this June. And so maybe we will see change at that time. Um, but that's kind of the um, case study, I guess, of how things went at White Earth. And it's, it's an ongoing process. It's a complicated, sticky process that um, we'll continue to work on. Miigwech for your time today. So this work that I'm going to share with you today is something I'm putting together for the special uh, joint uh, this special edition of Alternative that Damian Lee and I are putting together on adoption and Indigenous legal citizenship orders. And it actually stems from my previous work on what does uh, participatory democracy look like, where I, where I examined the community decision-making process at Kahnawake, where we use um, consensual decision-making. So the working title I've chosen is, How Did Adoption Become a Dirty Word? Um, Indigenous Citizenship Orders as Irreconcilable Spaces of Aboriginality. So that's a working title. It'll probably change. But we know that um, adoption, I, I mean, citizenship and identity is, um, has been something at the forefront of our imaginations uh, since contact. Um, you know, we, we've been weakened by this struggle that we find ourselves in and it's distanced us from the real issues at hand, and it's refocused our attention elsewhere. And so in this struggle for access to re resources which are lessening and lessening, identity and belonging then are intertwined with issues like governance and self-determination. And so in the past, you have exclusion, assimilation, and the negation of indigenous identities be becoming key components of the colonial drive for colonization. And we know this, um, and also in the ownership of the resources of Turtle Island. So we, the identity question then also centers in the conflict between official categories as we've moved forward and those that relate directly to the culture and traditions of the people in question. These categories have become central to the issues of self-determination and governance of indigenous communities, and they also serve to colonize us. Audra Simpson, in her work, Mohawk Interruptus, describes it as a calculus of predicaments, which includes the math, the clans, the mess, the misrecognitions, the confusion, and the clarity. And communal knowledge, then, and expression of other forms of identity and belonging are about that feeling side of recognition that, as Simpson expresses, is not juridical, but homegrown, dignified by local history and knowledge. <clears throat> 
and she characterizes them as refusals that tell us something about how we embed our representations and notions of sovereignty and nationhood that move us away from status forms of recognition. So then, in other words, um, identity then is related to official recognition by the Ban Council or the Canadian government, but it is also expressed most notably by traveling iron workers in her work um, as, a feeling, as, a, as a, a feeling relationship with the community. And so identity and belonging then are narrated as much as they are recognized by non-Mohawk legal orders. Um, but unfortunately, they have less weight um, than those uh, uh, officially um, identified by Canada. So as her reflections illustrate, citizenship for Ganawage, Ganawage Rono is more an expression of inherent law that conflicts with official membership under the rules implemented by the Mohawk Council of Ganawage. So then um, it's in academic discussions then we, are, we have very different understandings of indigenous citizenship and belonging. And the first is centered in the individual and has to do with rights-based citizenship, much like official Canadian citizenship. And the second then is centered in the collective and is associated with membership in groups, much like Ganyakahaga membership in the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. So the latter, Ganyakahaga membership in the Confederacy then is derived from historical consciousness of political membership within an autonomous Confederacy. And though it is touched on by Simpson, its significance is not taken far enough. So this work then that I'm, I'm doing frames um, most especially Haudenosaunee adoption, belonging, identity, formation, and other aspects of Indigenous presence within David Garneau's conception of irreconcilable spaces of Aboriginality, where he describes these as Indigenous intellectual spaces that exist apart from a non-Indigenous gaze and interlocution. They are gatherings, conversations, email exchanges, where indigeneity is performed apart from a settler audience not a show, simply an expression and a celebration of continuity without witnessing by people who are not equal performers. I extend this idea to include indigenous legal orders like the Gaya Goa, the Great Law of Peace, customary adoption practices, and the Haudenosaunee consensual decision-making governance process that is part of the community decision-making process at Kahnawake, all of which have relevance in this context then. So he clarifies then how these irreconcilable spaces of Aboriginality um, are in that he describes them as primary sites of resistance where there occurs perpetual act of refusal of complete engagement, where one speaks with one's own, in one's own way, refuses translation and full explanations, where, one, where trade goods are created that imitate core culture without violating it, and where one is not merely a native informant. But what happens when these spaces become public spaces? In the age of Facebook, Twitter, and Snapchat, we are seeing the emergence of an online environment that invites critical commentary and lateral violence by our own community members. Not only do we have to contend with the Indian Act policies, we are now having to engage with the World Wide Web observers who witness and comment on the dysfunction in our communities wrought by these policies. The process of revising the Gunawage law and membership becomes then an important example of what happens when irreconcilable spaces of Aboriginality become public. Key in this is the shift then in the definition of adoption as the, the community, the Gunawage membership law was revised. And it signals clearly the point that is being made here that Indigenous legal orders and citizenship practices must remain outside the Indian Act to be effective and ensure our survival as peoples. So um, the Gunawaga decision-making process, as I mentioned and I wrote about in the last paper, was designed and implemented in Gunawaga as a way to address the community's desire for more participation in decision-making. Its purpose was to teach the community how to think like a community again. And this is key for any Indigenous legal tradition to be effective. Participant engagement requires community-oriented thinking. The CDMP is comprised of many steps and includes multiple opportunities for community engagement. This process of building consensus is about ensuring all present have a voice in the changes to the laws. In these discussions, only registered community members can participate. And um, it is a radical shift away from the Indian Act process where laws were made in Ottawa and handed to the elected chief and band council for implementation. <coughs> 
The CDMP then was meant to be a space where we enacted self-determination. It was to be a way that incorporated our own traditions and brought them forward into the 21st century. In some ways, the CDMP could be seen as a move towards being an irreconcilable space of aboriginality. In these spaces, Garneau describes participants engage in continuous negotiations around things like identity and belonging. The codes, he says, are different than in the mainstream. We are different in these spaces. When people gather as a people, they act not only as individuals, but also as part of the group, differently than what they are when they perform themselves for the dominant other. This is what the intent was behind the CDMP, to provide a distinctly Haudenosaunee space for negotiation around the criteria for membership in the community, to enable community members to participate in and enact Indigenous legal orders in an Indigenous legal space. But this hasn't worked, despite the fact that these irreconcilable spaces of Aboriginality are meant to be sites of epistemological debate, this one isn't a safe space where one can simply be who they are or celebrate our continuity and exchange ideas, beliefs, and find solutions. So in the fall of 2016, revisions were made to the Gunawage Law and Membership um, that pertain to adoption. And it was decided that any non-Indigenous child adopted by a Gunawage family after 2003 could not be eligible to be recognized as a Ganyakahaga of Gunawage or an approved resident. Therefore, the parents were coming, committing an offense in adopting that child and would no longer be eligible to reside in Gunawage. So public response then was immediate. And upon the announcement of this revision, community members who posted to social media recognized that there was something wrong. And so it's been described then by Steve Bonspiel, uh, who called the revision short-sighted, and he described it as a move in the wrong direction. So commenting on the Protect the Bloodlines comment recorded in the record of conclusion for that hearing, Bonspiel highlights the practice of adoption as a way to build community and strengthening our might and bolstering our numbers. Bonspiel described examples of non-Native adoptees that had become important members of the community, Louis Cook and John and Zachariah Tarbell. Adoption, quite frankly, he said, is woven into the fabric of the Mohawk identity. Bonspiel, communicating the same sentiments expressed online by community members. Further, he wrote, we are living, breathing examples of what Mohawk people look and act like in the 21st century because of our extensive history of adoption. He expressed that there was a lack of empathy and consideration for the tradition of adoption what was also problematic, he said, is the perversion of democracy played out through the CDMP. So further on in this paper, I go through a full explanation of what exactly adoption looked like uh, for my ancestors and the role that it played in um, balancing our community. Um, it had a very different understanding and use in terms of strengthening, um, balancing the mind of the family members, um, using um, the morning war, uh, bringing captives back, that is completely been um, disregarded. But it's, like I said, Steve Bonspiel recognizes, and I recognized in looking at these Facebook posts, that that knowledge of that, that old adoption tradition was still understood and commented on. And so it's there still in the foundation of our community. So, um, just a minute. So in, I'm going to go back now and, and give you a, a, an understanding then of how we came to be in this position. So it sets the foundation for understanding, well, why would adoption become a dirty word? Why would it become something that is um, against the law, essentially? So in 1981, a moratorium on membership um, was presented to the community. And... Um, about um, out marriage um, of people from Gunawage to non-Indigenous peoples. In 1985, the Canadian government announced that Indian communities should make their own law on membership or federal laws would be applied. So the membership then is a fundamental issue of self-government as it determines who is entitled to the rights, benefits, and corresponding responsibilities of governments. Membership in Aboriginal communities in governments also has implications for provincial and national citizenship and for relationships with local governments and other Aboriginal governments. So essentially, it was an ultimatum that was given um, to the community from 1986 to 1988. 
So develop a law or else. And in 1996, the com in through community consultation, with limited involvement of actual community members, it showed that there were three perspectives on membership, um, re ranging from inclusionary to exclusionary practices. It also indicated the need to identify and include traditional values. What did that mean, though, in the formation of a membership law? So then the communal law on membership was drafted in 96. And um, it was based on community consultations then that asked for a more inclusionary approach to membership and it introduced the non-member residency and native lineage with two Mohawk grandparents as the dominant criterion for membership. In effect, removing the blood quantum as the prevailing criterion. So it also determined that a Mohawk never loses rights. So consultations also identified basic membership principles and a custom code on membership. And so at the same time, community members also protested the removal of the 50% blood quantum criterion and the 1981 moratorium on mixed marriages. So you can see there's a lot of turmoil that has under a lot of opposing views um, that have gone on through throughout as we've tried to figure out this identity question in our community. So in 1998, the elders of Ganawage wrote the declaration on Ganyakahaga membership of Ganawage. And it was signed by 21 elders who recommended the implementation of an elders council for decision making on applications for membership made under this custom code. They did not support blood quantum as the criterion and added knowledge of Ganyakahaga, Ganyakahaga lineage of three generations, respect for Mother Earth, and traditional clan affiliation. And the conditions for marrying out were kept. The final custom code on membership was released to the community um, through a feedback process. So it was passed in 1999 by the Mohawk Council of Gahnawage. Then we moved to 2003 where the code again is revised. And this is the one that kind of, it spurred me into action into trying to understand this because I was a graduate student at the time um, trying to figure this out. Why, why was my community in such turmoil? What was going on? And I wanted to understand it. So it said that this 2003 law is about respecting the collective right to determine our own membership. And, um, According to Ganawage laws, only individuals on the Ganawage Ganyakahaga registry are entitled to receive services and benefits, such as land allotments, residency, water and sewer, the ability to vote and own and operate a business. Um, status cards are only issued from the membership department to members on the Ganawage Ganyakahaga registry. And individuals who are on the INAC registry and not on the Ganawage Ganyakahaga registry are not entitled to these same services. So um, it was seen to be very problematic. And in a review of the law conducted in 2007, uh, it was described as a law developed with the intent to focus less on blood quantum and address eligibility of those who could be members or reside in the community. With the, rebuilding, with the emphasis on rebuilding ancestry and family ties, it was meant to encapsulate perceived positive thinking that would develop our community for the future and adjust to our changing needs. In this, the law was to provide for a registrar who administered the registry and the non-member residency list. Um, so then at that time, membership criteria uh, was membership at birth if identified as such, born of two members, born of one member and a member of six nations, has four or more great grandparents, has a clan or will go through the process to sit um, the clan. So the Council of Elders then was suspended in 2007 in response to this review and now it's undergoing extensive review and revision through the community decision-making process. So um, there was also in the problems with this uh, 2003 law there was issues with terminology and use of the term Ganawage Ronu versus Ganyakahago. So Ganawage Ronu means person of Ganawage, Ganyakahaga means for a better way to say it, Mohawk person. Um, Ganawage Ronu then um, the law was meant to deal with membership in the community where the term Ganawage Ronu would apply. The law cites Ganyakahaga which implies we are dealing with a member of the Mohawk nation which spans eight communities located throughout Ontario, Quebec, and New York State. And it's seen that these two terms could not be reconciled with when one individual. 
you can see the problems here. There's confusion. There's the terminologies is problematic. And um, additionally, adopted people would no longer be considered Ganyakahaga by blood, but Ganawagarono. And one of the major recommendations to come out of this um, report after it was suspended was a complete rework of the law to address the internal factors, terminologies, as well as the processes meant to administer the law. So then there was a, um, a review done of the Council of Elders, which is a group, the group that was meant to adjudicate the law. And it was found that there was a lack of accountability on the part of the Council of Elders. There were members who didn't respect the fundamental human rights of individuals and didn't work in accordance with natural justice, which was not clarified in the law or the report. There was also a lack of compassion and transparency. This is actually what was said. With regards to the functioning of the Council of Elders, the lack of clarity in the roles of the committee and membership staff had a role to play in confusing who is supposed to do what. With a high turnover of members, a lack of ability to resolve and manage conflict, it was felt that the committee and the law were out of alignment. So what we witnessed then, after it was implemented, was that it was creating divisions within families, and this is where I entered, um, where individual family members' backgrounds and history were called into question, and personal opinions of family members were taken into consideration, and in some instances, there were oppositional views in one family alone. The impacts on families are long-lasting, and this was stated concern for children who hear the discussions taking place in families and may direct negative derogatory behavior at other children and their families. So the Council of Elders then was tasked originally with implementing a law that was incomplete, which allowed for subjective interpretation and adjudication of applicants. In a letter made public in the Eastern Door, Wajo Montour published his reasons for resigning from the Council of Elders. He said it relates to the dysfunction that was endemic to the law and adjudication process. He wrote of the arbitrary decisions made um, where we had, they had to realize one great-grandparent is non ganyakahaga simply because a non-native name appears on the lineage chart. Montour called this discriminatory and unfair. And he wrote, this happens because if one of the great-grandparents being looked at is a woman, and this woman's father was non-native, the non-native name appears on the lineage chart, call, causing her to be discredited and is then not counted. On the other hand, if one of the great-grandparents being looked at is a man, and this man's mother was non-native, the non-native name does not appear on the lineage chart, causing him to receive full credit, and then it is counted. Montour's letter illustrates that this law and the process was not achieving its stated purpose and, and doing more harm than good. So we see then through the illustration of this legislation, the various legislation, the evolutions that it's gone through, it is clear there is a genuine community concern for the preservation of our identity, whatever that means. Um, the Ganawaga membership list um, is maintained separately and governed by membership criteria determined by the community, whereas, um, and another list is the federal list, as I mentioned before. So one begets federal rights while the other allows one to live in Ganawage and receive services administered in the community. So this second list then speaks to the enactment of the right to determine our own membership within and under the Indian Act, and which is coached in terms of the sovereign right of the Ganyakahaga Mohawk Nation. The identity issue comes with considerable concern for a fear of the erosion of culture, language, and bloodlines. And so a subtext here is the loss of resources that come from adding new members to the Ganawage list. Although it is widely accepted in the community that non-native ancestry is part of the Ganawage's history, descriptors like full, half, quarter, and C31 are used commonly with reference to individuals in the community. In fact, it is a second nature to use these terms. So as the community tries to revise the Ganawage law and membership through the CDMP, these terms and the harmful and dirty these terms and the harmful and dirty spaces they create make the CDMP a site of lateral violence. So what we see then is that there we see that there is an acknowledgement that there is a deep influence of the Indian Act on the collective consciousness of the community where it pertains to me membership and belonging. I mean in many other areas as well. Um, so the clearest example then we see is indicated by the use of terms like blood quantum and lineage to describe what is important for membership in Ganawage. So m multiple attempts we've seen have been made to move away from this kind of thinking. 
and um, putting priority on culture, language, and clan. However, it continues to come to resurface in subsequent versions of laws. And so this is this, the situation that we're at. So it's clear that Gunawaga is trying to disassociate from the colonial model while simultaneously entrenching itself, as Audra Simpson describes, as a nested sovereignty where a sovereignty may exist within a sovereignty. They stand in tension and challenge each other. And as we ask the question, Gunawaga, who are you? Whose citizen are you? What authority do you answer to? And attempts to answer that question with his own law, Gunawaga challenges the legitimacy of Canada. Framed by the settler state, Simpson describes, Gunawaga asserts its nationhood from within. It enacts its own sovereignty from its own territory. A 48 kilometer squared reserved land base. Simpson writes, indigenous sovereignties and indigenous political orders prevail within and apart from settler governance. This form of nested sovereignty has implications for the sturdiness of nation states overall, but especially for formulations of political membership as articulated and fought over within these nested sovereignties. So at part, it, the, the Gunawaga law and membership then, and this whole issue surrounding it reflects a part of Gunawaga's, the Gunawaga community's vision of what it means to be Gunyakahaga, which is consistent with self-determination efforts that are taking place throughout indigenous North America. One cannot bypass the fact that with the state of indigenous peoples, dispossession of lands and resources, loss of culture and community, the law was part of a strategy to regain a sense of Ganyakahaga identity. Unfortunately, it, has not been, it had not been fully thought out as it incorporated alien notions of Ganyakahaga identity. So add to this that um, there's a seriousness in the fact that effect, the effects and the outcomes will have a detrimental, detrimental impact on the genealogical stability of the community as increasing numbers of people choose to marry within the community to remain on their membership roles. Instead of broadening the gene pool by marrying out, this may result in serious birth defects and increased health problems in the future. Further, it does not reflect the inclusive spirit of the Rodanoshuni philosophy and understanding of identity that was illustrated in the old practice of adoption. So what we see then is that uh, the community decision making process, um, when we were discussing membership form informally in the community, the word adoption got bandied about with reference to how membership uh, in the community was determined a long time ago. And those who use it are trying to make the point that there was another way of doing things, but never fully articulate what exactly that means and how it worked. And this was seen more recently in 2016, like I mentioned earlier, when that amendment was made. So um, the ongoing public dialogue at the time of the original implementation um, leading up to uh, the revisions being made to the law, which is st it's still under revision five years later, um, right now on the 20th, they're going to be going to have a community decision making. They're going in through the process to determine exactly what a great grandparent means. So you can see that it's been a slow process. Um, community members don't feel safe in going to these meetings. Sometimes there's 40 people, sometimes there's five. And in my community, there's anywhere from seven to 9,000 people coming and going. So that's a very small number of people who are there determining the future of our community. And so, when I think about David Garneau's conception of Aboriginal sites of um, in Indigenous citizenship orders as irreconcilable spaces of Aborigin Aboriginality, the community decision-making process was meant to be that. It was meant to move in that direction. But through um, the infusion or through the lasting impacts from uh, the Indian Act system, also in the mindset not only within the community and the, the policies that are in place or the system that's in place there, um, but also within the mindset of our people, it's hard to fit a square peg into a round hole where we're left trying to enact indigenous legal orders in a system that is not meant to allow for that. And so you have this idea that using consensual decision making, using our traditional ways, our, our, our indigenous legal citizenship order, our way of doing things, um, doesn't fit, and so it's become a public site, and so I'm questioning, I, I question that. <laughs> 
it's just, it's a case study, essentially. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, those are both great presentations. Um, you'll see here that I'm coming from a very different angle. Uh, so I'm Daryl, and uh, I want to thank the organizers. This is, so far, I've learned a lot. It's been a great conference up until now, and I especially want to thank Valerie O'Brien, who did an amazing job putting everything together and staying in constant contact, and uh, my flight was canceled yesterday, and I didn't know what was going to happen, and somehow she called me. I don't even know how she found out, and here I am. So thank you. <laughs> that was wicked. Uh, so, uh, for the past couple years now, I've been studying um, my people, French Canadians, uh, French Quebecois, Acadians, I'm related to all of them. Um, like a, like uh, Chelsea was saying, I'm originally from Sudbury. Both my parents are French Canadians. They were both born in the Sudbury area. Um, and what I've been looking at specifically are um, sort of the, is the history of genealogy, in part, um, but particularly the ways in which French descendants, so I'm going to call those who are related to the earliest French colonizers, French descendants, um, because those people aren't just in Quebec, they're not just in Ontario, they're not just in Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, some are in Vermont, New Hampshire, Illinois, uh, Louisiana, etc. So this applies to all of those in different ways, as we'll see shortly. Um, so I've been studying the ge genealogy, uh, genealogical field, which is very common among uh, French descendants. It's a, a very, um, there's a, a really a lot of infrastructure. Um, you can basically trace most, if not all, of your ancestors to the early 1600s using online databases, which I did as part of my, my study. I found 2,500 ancestors that I'm directly related to going back to 1621. Um, and like I said, it just takes time. You have to be willing to sit down and fill in all this information. Um, but I have time. I was on sabbatical, and I was getting paid to do research like this, which I hope you find is useful to you in some way. Um, so this is part of a, a book project that I've completed, I'm hoping will be published next year with the University of Manitoba Press, and it's called Hyperdescent in an Age of Reconciliation. I'm not really going to get into what I mean by hyperdescent. I'm going to talk about the practice itself. So I'm not really giving much of an analysis of what I'm looking at here. I'm more giving you the mechanism, how this works, as opposed to why it's happening. All right, so um, what I started by doing was uh, studying online genealogy forums. So some of you may be familiar with Kim Talbert's work. Uh, she wrote a book called Native American DNA. And in that book, that's part of what she did. So she went on uh, listservs, um, particularly listservs uh, where people were using what's called genetic genealogy, so DNA ancestry testing, um, and trying to discover, and you've probably seen commercials about this, whether it's on TV, sometimes on YouTube, oh my god, I'm 2% Native American. Um, I never knew, or whatever the case is. Um, so Kim has talked about that, and she's studied these online forums. So I kind of take off from where Kim's um, coming from, in a way, by studying online genealogy forums, some of which are related to DNA or genes, most of which are related to blood um, in the sense of ancestral uh, connections. So I study three in French, two in English. They're all related to... Um, French descendants who are searching for indigenous ancestors. Okay, so uh, whether it's in French or in English, like I was saying, mostly in English, it's groups of people who are in the uh, in, in New England, but also in some cases in Ontario. Um, and what I what I found is there's three different ways, so three different mechanisms, if you will, where French descendants are claiming to be indigenous today. So if you're unaware of this, before I get into those mechanisms, there's a quite large movement currently going on um, in Ontario, Quebec, and the East Coast, where French descendants like myself are taking a long ago ancestor and now claiming to be indigenous, usually in the form of a quote unquote Eastern Métis identity, but in the, for the purpose of the Algonquins of Ontario Agreement, which uh, Russ has um, written about, also for an Algonquin identity as part of that treaty process, which I can talk more about later. And in New England, Vermont, New Hampshire, as part of an Abenaki identity. Okay, so, um, yes, yeah, so there's this movement going on. If you look at the census records, for instance, uh, between 2001 and 2016, anywhere from triple, quadruple, or five times the number of people who are identifying as Métis in those provinces, 
uh, that I mentioned, particularly Quebec, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, um, has it's increased three to five times in those provinces. Okay, so uh, if we take the example of Nova Scotia, and I know there's a couple people from Nova Scotia, from Mi'kma'ki here, uh, where I generally live. Um, generally, because I'm on sabbatical and I'm not living there now. Uh, but uh, we see that between 1996, so in 1996 in Nova Scotia, there are 830 people who are saying they're Métis in the census. In 2016, there's 23,300. Okay, so it's gone up more than 25 times. In, uh, you see that there's a short, um, not a short, that's the wrong word, um, a smaller in increase that happens between the 1996 and 2001 census, that's after the Marshall decision, where uh, the Mi'kmaq were recognized as having inherent rights, particularly to harvesting fish, and that came a whole, maybe some of you have seen the Alana Sobosmawan film, um, is the crown at war with us? Uh, where Eskenobidic, the community of Eskenobidic, burnt church, um, basically is under attack by um, a lot of Acadian um, folks, burning docks, ramming boats, and also the RCMP. Many of those people start calling themselves Métis because they see an opportunity to um, have access to certain um, Aboriginal rights. So this happens uh, on the East Coast, but it's happening more and more in Quebec in particular. So in Quebec now, there are, uh, in the 2016 census, there's 69, over 69,000 people who call themselves Métis. And in the 2001 census, there were 15,000. Um, so again, you see quite a large increase along with this, and I have a database that I've um, uh, put together. I'm more than happy to share the link with you. It's, it's available on, on Google Drive, uh, where I've documented all of the organizations on the East that recognize, quote unquote, are advocating for Eastern Métis people. Um, and what that takes is basically proof of any indigenous ancestor at any point in time. Um, but I'll complicate that a bit in a second, because some of those indigenous ancestors are made up. So, I'm just talking about a phenomenon, all of these political organizations, literally dozens of them, now claiming that they're representing Eastern Métis, these, uh, diff these spikes in the um, census in terms of self-identification. So there's all kinds of different sort of levels of proof. Of course, there's all kinds of court cases. I just actually got an email from a friend who is a lawyer, a, uh, a lawyer in Nova Scotia, who just looked at um, court cases in uh, Nova Scotia and New Brunswick, and there are 12 two of which have gone to the Supreme Court, where Eastern Métis people have claimed to have hunting and fishing rights, and they've lost every single one of them. But um, there's all these efforts to assert Aboriginal rights um, in the East as a quote-unquote Métis person. And this is all done by French descendants. That doesn't mean the people speak French. This isn't me being anti-French. I'm French-Canadian, I speak French, so do my parents, et cetera, et cetera. But this is specific, specific to, and this is what I'm looking at, how this is part of a particular ideology and discourse in French Canada um, that sees French colonizers as very friendly with Aboriginal peoples. You're probably familiar with that story, um, much friendlier than the British and the Spanish, for instance. And that story also allows for these types of claims. So even if people aren't claiming an identity, oftentimes, say, for in, Mont in Montreal, where I'm living now, I'll, a lot of my friends have told me where white people like me will say, well, I have an ancestor in 1635 who's indigenous, and therefore I can't be racist. So shut up with your complaints. So that's partly how it gets used and mobilized. And the mic didn't like that. So much for being rhetorical. So uh, OK. What I'm seeing on the genealogy forums and what I'm writing about, I developed this concept of hyperdescent. Hyperdescent is uh, primarily based on um, claiming a long ago ancestor. One of the things that's relatively unique I suppose, particularly when it comes to other white settlers in what we may call Canada, is that French descendants, by a large majority, likely have an indigenous ancestor. So that's what historical demographic research shows. It's not because there were many, many indigenous women who married Frenchmen in the early colony. That's a complete lie. That's not true. If we look at the records, we're talking about a handful of women. It's that those women married Frenchmen early in the colony. So they had many children early in the colony, which just means you're kind of like two or three generations ahead of other people who are having children later on. So um, for instance, the three women who come up the most in the genealogy forums, I've counted the number of descendants that they have, um, and it's between 200,000 to 800,000 each. Okay, So those are just three women. So you can imagine, and I've, gone, and I've done this calculation also in relation to uh, which women show up in member genealogies for the different organizations. I've looked at over 5,000 member genealogies from I think it's five different organizations, and it's always the same women who come up for the most part. So 
The same is true, obviously, of the genealogy forums. Before I did all the other stuff on the member genealogies, I'm looking at these forums and I'm starting to learn all this stuff. It was really fascinating. There's also a lot of debate. There's a lot of pushback uh, on the forums that I wasn't expecting, which is something that actually Kim Talbert talks about in her book. The first form of hyperdescent that I've identified, so I've identified, I've identified three. This is what I'm going to present to you. The first one is lineal hyperdescent, and it's the most straightforward, the most common. It's literally, I have um, an indigenous woman ancestor, because it's invariably a woman, um, in, uh, who gets married in 1644 or 1671, and um, that makes me indigenous today. Okay, so that's the most straightforward way. Um, I did my own genealogy as part of this project. Like I said, I found 2,500 ancestors. I have the average, um, according to historical demographers, genealogy for French Canadians. So over 95% of my root ancestors, so ancestors basically at the time of first contact, if you will, or in the early 1600s, 95% are French. Uh, two to three percent are uh, otherwise European, so a couple German, one German woman actually, several British, an Irish guy, et cetera, et cetera, and uh, just under one percent are indigenous. Okay, so that's the average ancestry or ancestral history for French descendants. Um, so if everybody who had one of those women as, a, as an ancestor was claiming to be indigenous today, we're talking about over 10 million people. Okay. That's something just to put into perspective. And that's not me exaggerating, right? There's, this is just a rough estimate. There's over 15 million French descendants um, in Canada and the United States, okay? So it's a lot of people. Uh, not everyone clearly is saying they're indigenous. Only about 200,000 are currently as part of organizations, for instance. So it's a relatively small phenomenon that has more than quadrupled in the past 10 to 15 years. If it continues to quadruple, you see what I'm getting at, right? So, um, the first form, like I said, lineal hyperdescent. One thing that, that struck me that I wasn't expecting is that the same woman, and I don't mean one, there's several of them, like I said, a handful, but in particular, let's talk about one woman. She'll be reclaimed to become Métis in Quebec, to be Abenaki in, New, in Vermont, and to be Algonquin in Ontario. The same woman, okay? So, um, and in the, in the case of the Algonquins of Ontario, the Algonquin Nation Secretariat, um, which has been opposed to the treaty negotiations, as far as I know. They've, uh, they, and, and the, um, the Algonquins of Pickwaganagan, Golden Lake, who um, are the only federally recognized Algonquin community in Ontario, they've opposed the addition of some of these ancestors to the Algonquins of Ontario. Um, uh, it's not a banned list, it's called the, uh, I forget what it's called, but essentially there's a list of uh, ancestors that you can relate to to become Algonquin. What's that? Yeah, okay, the enrollment list. Um, so they've, they've opposed the addition of many of these um, ancestors, but they were overruled by a judge who decides, who um, goes on the list. Um, so that's the case for several women that I've tracked. Um, so they're reclaimed, uh, whether or not they're Algonquin in the historical record or they're identified as Abenaki, they are reclaimed for all three identities. Okay, so, and that happens regularly. Um, I'll come back to this a little bit later, but there's something about the way that Indigenous women are being used for the purpose here of um, claiming an identity that's quite different than what people have experienced through their lifetime. Um, and especially given that many of the organizations start are started by men as hunting rights organizations that oppose Indigenous land claims, which I will get to at the end of the presentation. So we see that these women are being reclaimed for the purpose of opposing actual Indigenous people, likely their kin, <laughs> Um, so there's something very problematic in the way that these women are being recolonized and are becoming part of these uh, white settler strategies to um, dispossess indigenous people. So the second form of hyperdescent that I saw, which was the most surprising to me, again, I went into this not knowing anything about this. Okay, so this is something that I'm picking up as I'm going through the forums. I have about five to 600 pages of transcripts from the forums and I'm reading them over and over again. And I'm like, wait a second, what's this, what's this? Um, and the second form is what I call aspirational hyperdescent. And that's where a woman in the past whose background isn't really, there's not much known about her, which is not surprising considering who's writing histories at the time. Uh, and I'm talking here about European colonizing histories. Um, they mostly focus on men, so most of the information about the men is known. But some of the French women, we don't know much about where they come from, or we do, but the records are a little bit obscure. Who knows? Uh, what happens in a lot of cases is that those French women are remade as indigenous. 
So they're not actually indigenous women at all. They're French women um, who are now being used for the purpose of calling oneself indigenous today. So if I take an example, I did an analysis of uh, just over 1,900 member genealogies of the um, Manawaki Métis community. And uh, 20, I think it's 26% of their, the root ancestors used by uh, those 1,900 people um, are women who are French. That is their sole connection, quote unquote, to being indigenous, is a woman who has been remade as indigenous against all available evidence. But people want to believe right, that they're indigenous for whatever purpose, right? Again, I'm not getting so much into the why, I'm talking about the mechanisms. So um, I have about a, a list of about 10 um, women. I'm related to five of them, once four times, another three times. Yeah, so I'm, I'm related to many of them. Uh, and in my book, I go through a case study of, of four of them to look at uh, what stories are being told about them that justifies them being used as an indigenous root ancestor today. Um, and even in the face of what one would think is often used as um, definitive evidence, so uh, DNA ancestry testing, so we can, there's a way in which that can happen going back if you follow women's lines. It's called mitochondrial DNA. Again, not really going to get into it. You can trust me on that. Is it true? That's a whole other question. But um, even in the face of tests that show that these women are French, through DNA ancestry testing, so, so through scientific evidence, people will continue to assert that they were French, uh, that they were indigenous. Okay, so the evidence doesn't matter. What matters is that people come to the evidence wanting to confirm what they believe. And that's something that Sirke Sturm points out in her work, um, a book called Becoming Indian, which has been very influential in me thinking about this process. Um, and she, she uh, develops the concept of race shifters, which is what I'm using to explain what's going on here. Okay, so aspirational hyperdescent, we're making up an indigenous ancestor in the past. They generally, organizations um, a little bit all over, are, are pretty open about using those um, ind individuals from the past as root ancestors in their membership. The last one is what I call lateral hyperdescent. Um, and it, it, all of these are obviously connected. Uh, someone asked me the other day, how is that not this type? And I'm like, well, it is in a way, but I'm just trying to like offer some specificity because it looks and feels a little different. Um, I'll give an example here. Louis Riel is inevitably the person who comes up the most often on the online genealogy forums for what I've identified as lateral hyperdescent. And this is where someone is like, oh my god, I have a Riel ancestor. There's a Riel who's Métis. I'm Métis. That is not the way that genealogy works. <laughs> but under these logics, what I'm calling the logic of hyperdescent, it is very much the way that genealogy works because one doesn't necessarily have to prove it definitively, one just has to make a claim. And as you can probably imagine, uh, white people like myself, given this whole discourse of reconciliation, don't wanna be telling anyone who's claiming that they're indigenous that they're not indigenous, right? Because inevitably, and this has happened to me through my research, we get called racist, and that stings. Um, so, that's lateral hyperdescent. I've given one example, Riel, but I found several others in my research. Now, I just wanted to present hyperdescent as the logic, if you will, and um, I'm more than happy to answer some questions about it. And I want to be clear because this is something that I think people uh, in passing have heard about some of what I'm doing, and they, they obviously this is a very complex matter, and I want to be clear that I'm not, what my research is about white people. Okay, and it's about the boundaries of whiteness and of white supremacy, really, which you'll see in a second. I saw it. Thanks. Um, <laughs> I'm in the middle of something. <laughs> um, it's about white people, right? Well, yeah, yeah, I remember that part. Yeah. Ah, man, I shouldn't have made that joke. Oh yeah, this is not about people being dispossessed or um, disconnected through the Indian Act, the residential schools, um, the 60s scoop, and even today, like forms of child abduction, whether it's uh, foster care or imprisonment, right? That, this is not what my research is about. Um, it's about literally a, a, a person, usually a, a woman, sometimes indigenous, sometimes not, in the 1600s that people are discovering through genealogy. So I just want to make that clear, okay? Um, so, right, I researched two organizations. 
Uh, one is the, an organization that um, is in Saguenay and in, the, in Quebec. Um, I'm not going to talk about its name. It's very long and in French, and so I'll just say the group from Saguenay, and then a group from Gaspésie. Okay, so they're both in Quebec. Um, first of all, the group in Saguenay, it, um, what I was able to discover in researching it, so it's the first group to make um, a claim to having Aboriginal rights in Quebec under the Pauli decision. So the Pauli decision occurred in 2003, um, and basically, it was the first court decision to recognize, this is the Supreme Court, um, a Métis population that wasn't connected to the Red River Métis or Métis people out west. Um, and it kind of gave a broad understanding of Métis, but it still had criteria that you have to meet. That's all I'll say about it right now, but we can talk more about it later. The important thing is that prior to this, there's a white rights movement that takes that sort of um, emerges in this region, um, quite an active one, violent one, virulent one. Um, starting in 2000, 2001, that lasts till about 2004. Okay, so there's three major organizations that are formed, and this is all because there's land negotiations between the government, governments, and uh, the Anu. Okay, so this is in a new territory, um, and it's not a new thing. The Anu uh, have faced incredible um, forms of violence when it comes to asserting um, their rights to the fishery. Some of you might remember the salmon wars in the 1970s and 1980s, which also affected the Mi'kmaq. But um, this is not a new thing uh, in that region. I, I want to make that clear. But there's these organizations that are formed. And what is interesting to me, uh, or what, I was what I've been able to note, is that many of the people um, who later become Métis, this is where I'm going, right? They're the lead organizers of the white rights movement. Okay, so they're very clearly people who identify as right, white. Actually, one of the organizations is called the Association for White Rights. Um, so they're not like backing away from being white. Uh, and those people get to know each other in organizing against indigenous land claims, or land claim in this case, and then Pauli happens, and they openly talk about this. I have 31 interviews with them, not that I conducted, but that they presented as part of a court case where they openly admit that this was a political strategy. Oh, Pauli happens. We have indigenous ancestors. We're Métis, because it is the only way we can stop this treaty. That's what they say. That's their quote-unquote chief who says that, and several of their members. Their most prominent, uh, one of their most prominent board members and the chief of one of their clans, I kid you not, um, is the founder of the Association for White Rights. He was called the White Defender, the Defender of White Rights by uh, a major newspaper in Quebec City at this time. And um, he becomes a founding board member. He becomes quote unquote Métis. He founds another organization in 2012 and he is still a spokesperson for that organization on their board as are several other members of the Association for White Rights. Okay, that's just one example in that region. Um, and right, I'm moving to Gaspésie. I have very little time left and um, I'm almost wrapping up, it's fantastic. So in Gaspésie, what happens is there's um, the Mi'kmaq at uh, Gaspésie. So this is a Mi'kmaq community in Quebec, uh, sort of near the border with uh, uh, New Brunswick. They sign a, a, a territorial agreement. It's not a land claim, but it's a territorial agreement to run, um, uh, to, to basically, to manage a particular territory. They're called pauvoiries in Quebec. It's like an outfitting um, territory, right? It's, it's gonna be quite large. Uh, the Mi'kmaq have been working on it for years. They sign an agreement, and then hunters get wind of it. Ha, huh, surprise. Um, a few of the hunters that hunt on that territory and have been for only 20 years at that point, because it used to be a wildlife re reserve, they uh, organized themselves into um, a, a hunting rights association, a nine-member hunting rights association. When Pali happens and they get wind of it, they turn themselves into a Métis organization. In the same way as happened across the river in, yes, in Segni. Nine people end up actually bringing down the agreement. Obviously, there's other hunters in the region who are opposing it, other landowners, but those nine people which now has morphed into an organization with nearly 20,000 members. It is the largest self-identified Métis organization in Canada. They have nearly 20,000 members and they started as a nine-person hunting rights organization. That, or, that agreement, much to, the, much to the, I don't know what to say, um, disappointment of, of the Mi'kmaq at Giscabi Yak, who have been very outspoken about this, um, has never seen the light of day. Um, and this organization has been empowered um, through selling memberships to, again, many, many people. Most of um, their, 
the root ancestors that they claim are Acadian, and several of them are these uh, women who are French. Um, and I also have um, interviews with those two that I didn't conduct, sorry, two of their founding board members, where they openly talk about the success that they had in putting an end to um, the territorial agreement. So I'm gonna leave it there. Okay, so um, I think, thank you very much to all three of you, giving us lots to think about. I think we, we I know Val, we wanna wrap up close to three, and I have a short announcement to make um, before three o'clock. So I'd like to just take the opportunity to open the floor up for questions or comments. Okay. Uh, can you hear me okay? This is good? Okay, so uh, thank you, uh, Zabuni, for your presentations. Um, my question, I guess, is, is directed uh, to Jill about White Earth. Um, I think the White Earth uh, constitutional referendum process is seen as a seminal constitutional process for the tribal nations in the U.S., um, although it hasn't been successful yet. Uh, we have learned a lot from what you've uh, accomplished at White Earth. But I had a few questions for you. Um, two mainly. One, um, how did per capita payments influence your conversation, the per capita payments from the different business enterprises that White Earth Nation has? And then the second question is, you said that 80% of the, of the vote was in favor. Um, what did that, what did the voting population, or those, the, the amount of participants in the vote actually reflect of your overall citizenry for White Earth? Yep, yeah, okay. two great questions. Um, I sped through my presentation maybe a little bit, probably left a few things out. So per capita payments, uh, White Earth doesn't currently have a per capita payment. There's currently, uh, can you hear me? Yes, 18, almost, probably almost 19,000. Like I said, the population has been declining at White Earth a little bit, but I think we're, we're probably still close to 19,000 or so citizens at this time, and there is no per capita payment. There are definitely people who wish there was, and I think um, would, would maybe occasionally talk about that, like, well, we already have too many people, right? We can't get a per capita payment. Um, the vote itself, White Earth has had a serious, history related to election fraud. So uh, throughout the 80, late 80s and all through the 90s, there was rampant election fraud at White Earth and a number of elected officials went to jail to prison in the late 90s for participating in those activities. And so election participation at White Earth has, has continued to be difficult ever since those times because many people feel like their, their vote doesn't matter. Um, because for a long time it didn't. Uh, so typically at White Earth, about 10%, 8% of the population will vote. For the referendum on the Constitution, we got more than double the typical participation, but that still is a relatively low, uh, about 20% or so of the population that could vote. So. Voting is a very sticky business. We ran the election at White Earth by mail-in ballot only, which is known to get higher voter turnout. It also follows in the US the secretarial provisions for a secretarial election. And so some people frowned upon that process, but in fact, we got a much higher turnout, I think, than we would have got if we had ran under the MCT election code. I just wanted to ask, Daryl, could you talk a little bit about how the federal government is reacting to the Eastern Métis? Sure. Uh, so I, I, I talked briefly about court cases, but there's no level of government, whether it's provincial or federal, that recognizes the Eastern Métis as an indigenous people. Um, recently, Carolyn Bennett, um, who's the minister of whatnot, I forget, there's so many different titles going around. <laughs> She's the Minister of Indian Agents. She, um, she said that she would meet with the Eastern Métis. I don't know what that means, but um, with who, who knows? But she's not meeting with me. 
So this question is for Daryl. Um, can you just explain a little bit more about the, um, the last example you were talking about mm -hmm. and how that organization who claims to be Métis kind of derailed the, um, the territorial agreement? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I can. Um, I mean, the reason that I know this is partly that I, I went back in, in the archives and I looked at newspaper articles, so interviews with people at the time. Um, but also, uh, this organization is currently in court. I, they just lost a case, but they have three other cases in court where they're trying to get the court to recognize them as having Section 35 Aboriginal rights as a Métis people. Um, so. It, as part of one of those cases, one of their members, who um, was it one of the, found, the nine founding members, um, he was charged with uh, overfishing flounder in the ocean, which is a federal offense, so he's in federal court right now. And um, both the current chief, uh, I, don't, I should say that in quotation marks, but president chief, and um, him, they gave uh, preliminary testimony. And so I have those, they're about uh, 900 pages together long, long transcript where they openly talk about this. Um, so basically what they talk about, and this is the connection that I also, are the usefulness that I found in Sir K. Sturm's work. Um, she talks about how for race shifters to move from ancestry to identity, there has to be extended social contact prior. So it's not so much that people know about their ancestry, it's how they come to know about it. And this is, this is perfectly illustrated in this case. So they talk about how they're hunting buddies, hunting in the fall for moose, and they, you know, sit around, shoot the shit, drink some beer. And they're like, oh, what are we going to do to stop this agreement? And one of them says, well, we all have Indian ancestors. Oh. And then the next year they go, hey, did you hear about the Pali decision? This might be a way for us to stop the treaty. And that's basically how they form. Originally, they had a hunting organization, but this is how they morph into a quote-unquote Métis organization. Right now, they're known as, they call themselves the Métis Nation of the Rising Sun. That's, they have an English and French name um, because they're on the East Coast. Their chief last year said that they're making a claim to all of Eastern North America. I, I don't know how that works. You know, and it's, it's kind of funny in a way because I can hear you laughing. But um, it's, it's also like on the ground in that place, it's had very real impacts on the Mi'kmaq people, right, who saw this project as a way to create their leaders were talking about this is going to create 20 to 30 full-time regular well-paying jobs for our community members and it's going to reconnect us to a part of our territory that you have kept us from right and so in in my book I, I show this sort of this opposition that's occurring um, and part of their discourse is a completely anti-indigenous discourse right it brings up the whole tax-paying citizen thing it brings up this fear of indigenous people as not being civilized, you know, I don't want to really want to get into that, and I don't get into the details too much in my book, but it's clear that that ideology is at the basis because they have to bring people on board, and they're bringing people on board to oppose actual indigenous people, who, by the way, they're claiming their ancestors as their kin, some of whom are French, Let's be, but you know, that, that's essentially what's happening. So, um, I, I, does that answer your question? A little bit more? Kinda. What, what, what exactly is it that well, I, I guess some so how does that how does that fake Métis group yeah. derail the process like are they saying they're oh, because, opposing to it because oh yeah absolutely from the get-go as soon as they when they're a hunting rights organization they oppose it right when they're a Métis organization they oppose it all of a sudden the government's faced with the situation what there's a new and there's an indigenous group we didn't know about maybe we needed to consult them so the group in Saguenay they, they try to get an injunction the group in Gaspésie says they're going to get an injunction because they weren't consulted. It doesn't happen, but the government says, well, this is getting pretty complex. We're going to send a negotiator because it's getting a bit heated in there. As you can imagine, there's all these displays of violence. Indigenous kids in particular are getting attacked at school. All this stuff is happening in those regions. And so the negotiator goes and is like, well, we're going to cut back the amount of territory and we're, you know, we're going to make a compromise with these upset white people. Those are our constituents. And eventually that leads to, it grows and it grows. Within a couple years, they have 3,000 members, right? And they're saying that 90% of the Gaspésie population, not including the Mi'kmaq, right? But 90% of the white population is indigenous. That's what they're saying, our Métis. 
the group in Saguenay, in that region, that would be 100,000 people, a little bit more than 100,000. In Saguenay, where there's 350,000 people in those two regions, they're saying that 80 to 85 percent of the territory is Métis, right? There would be, if that was the case in those two regions, the Métis would represent something like 95 percent of the indigenous population of Quebec. It might be 90, you know, but right now, the so-called Métis, according to the census in Nova Scotia, are 47% of the people who, who are Aboriginal in Nova Scotia, right? And they were less than 20%. They actually, they were less than 10% in 1996. They were 6.5. And in Quebec now, they're up to almost 40% of the people who identify as Aboriginal. And they were less than 20% 15 years ago. We went. All right, thank you. If I can so, also, oh, oh, if I could just briefly add on to that, that I think, you know, it is, you know, like you said, we're kind of laughing at this, some of it, but also, I think it is groups like this that ultimately drive fear regarding lineal yeah. descent because then there's fear that, oh God, there are all these people out there who want to try to find one ancestor so that they can somehow come in without creating relationships who have a bad intention. And so that creates fear. And, and you're pointing out that many of these people don't actually have an indigenous ancestor, but maybe you know, mm -hmm. if you go to 16, whatever, whatever, you could find somebody. So, yeah. So I'm going to allow for one more question, just so we can try and wrap it up as close to three as possible. I've already had a chance. I'm going to. Sure? Okay. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Hannah Martin, and I am uh, a Mi'kmaq from uh, Tadamagush, Nova Scotia, a place where the water is barred by sand. Um, studying here at McMaster, and I just have a question for Daryl and anybody else who would like to maybe add to it. So um, after Russ's um, segment on the panel earlier, I was thinking a lot about the modern um, treaty uh, negotiations that are just starting actually um, in Mi'kma'ki. So Carolyn Bennett was just in Jibuktuk in Halifax a few weeks ago to have the first consultation, apparent, I think it was the first consultation, where only one elder uh, across Mi'kma'ki uh, showed up, who was Alma Brooks, who is, I believe, of the Walasto um, nation. So she's not actually even Mi'kmaq, but she was invited, of course, uh, rightfully so. But she was the only elder who showed up. Uh, I think there was a group of Mi'kmaq lawyers who were, or law students who were able to go as well, but there was really nobody who showed up. Um, the, our AFN representative did nothing to let us know that this is even starting. So my question, I guess, is after our history of fighting for our rights um, in the Peace and Friendship Treaties, um, thanks to people like Donald Marshall Jr., um, and especially in this time of entering this new process to either, um, I guess, submit to this new process where we might enter into a modern treaty, we might not, um, what um, challenges do you see uh, with there being this uh, self-proclaimed Métis group um, in the East Coast in terms of um, uh, citizenship and um, who is going to be able to have a say in this consultation with, with the modern treaty if we do enter one. Mm -hmm. um, so what implications does this new self-proclaimed, well not new, but um, the self-proclaimed group have on this process and how can Mi'kmaq people, um, you know, like my brother who's a hunter, Mm -hmm. um, how can, you know, how are we going to be able to have our voices heard um, when there's this group that is also apparently part of the process now? So if any of you want to um, answer to that question, but uh, it's a bit more directed at Daryl. So All right. Thanks, we'll you. I've been at Tatum Gush many times. It's a beautiful place. Awesome. Brown trout fishing is fantastic. Um, okay, so first of all, the, the, these Acadian Métis groups, they are new groups. So some of them are founded um, as far back as 2008. Um, but most of them are founded recently, as almost all of the Eastern Métis organizations that I found, 95% of them are founded after Pauli, um, and in particular, as time goes on, even more recently. Um, none of them are going to be part of, at the moment, none of them are part of any of the modern-day treaties. I will, I'm talking about in Mi'kma'ki. One thing that has happened in the past couple weeks is that a group... Um, uh, representing uh, some so-called Acadian Métis um, outside of El Sabokdok. Some of you may have heard of that community, the largest Mi'kmaq community in New Brunswick, uh, has filed the first, um, it's the first Eastern Métis group to file um, an indigenous land claim. Um, so they're, I think either they filed it or they're about to file it. Uh, 
and it overlaps with Elsa Bogtuk's um, land claim as well. They know that, they know it opposes Elsie's land claim, but they're going ahead with it anyways. Um, and again, this is based on some speculation about some French women who might have been Mi'kmaq in the 1600s and likely um, also some actual Mi'kmaq ancestors from the 1600s, but no relationship, um, kinship-based relationship with living Mi'kmaq people today. Okay, so um, that's one thing that's going on. I, uh, that'll be something that the courts decide on, uh, and that may impact that your question around modern-day treaties. I know that the different organizations, and I want to be clear for a second, actually, uh, just to come back to the example I gave from a new territory, there are many, many new people, grassroots people, who are opposing those treaties for very different reasons than the white rights activists, all right? And I would be, you know, supporting those folks. And that's also true in Mi'kmaq, right? There's a lot of people who think these modern-day treaties are super problematic. The organization that um, uh, is negotiating around that, uh, KMK is the uh, acronym, um, has a lot of opposition in Mi'kmaq communities. Um, but I know that they're fielding a lot of questions from so-called uh, Métis people who are calling to say, how do I get in on this? So part of what they need to do is come up with some sort of membership, uh, you know, who they're going to include in this modern-day treaty. Um, but on the ground right now, it seems like there's quite a lot of opposition by Mi'kmaq people to um, these new, like, like you said, new um, so-called Acadian Métis groups. And uh, like I pointed out to Russ earlier, who's standing up right over there, he knows a lot more about this than I do, but one of the things that happened with the Algonquins of Ontario Agreement, and it's very complex and convoluted, but essentially what it came down to is an Ontario court judge decided who, was, who were the Algonquin ancestors for the basis of the modern day treaty. Not Algonquin people. And that's what it came down to. And that is something you want to avoid. Because it will include every single potential um, uh, indigenous ancestor of every single person um, out there. And that's what happened, right? It includes 12 people prior to um, 1680. Um, so that a lot of people like me, French, French Canadians who live in uh, Ontario, are part of this treaty who have had no relationship with an indigenous person, kinship-based or otherwise, like in my family. There's no relationship with indigenous people. I'm not even, I'm not even friends, you know what I mean? For, <laughs> for centuries. I know because and some of my family members grew up next to reserves, and it was not love and compassion, and I really want you to make me kin. You know, no, 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 that's not what was going on. Um, and I'm not, I'm not proud of that. I'm just telling you that like this, this story that's being told today that we had to hide, no, 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 that is a story that is, will, will evoke compassion on the part of other white settlers, but it's a very dangerous story that is being used to oppose indigenous sovereignty.